Hello, my name is Lottie Mills. I'm in my second year studying English here at Newnham. Um, creative writing is a huge passion of mine, and so I was really delighted to compose this story, especially for the 150th anniversary of Newnham. Um, it's called Pandora. I was a strange child. I stared too long and too hard with my dark eyes 1,000 years old. I never cried, and if I did, I cried silently. I suppose you could say I had something of a stoic streak. My clothes smelt of rainwater and dust. I might have smiled, but it was difficult to tell. My nose, mouth and jaw had, long ago, been swallowed whole by the top of a book and were now seldom seen. My mother said I had a box brain. Meticulous, intrinsic little thing that I was, I picked up every stray thing I saw or heard or thought, dusted li a little, folded it neatly into a child-sized bun bundle, pressing the edges flat with a grimace, and locked it away, safe forever from the ravages of forgetting, impossible for anyone to steal. The world certainly tried its hardest. Teachers and relatives and all adults who knew best would scrabble at my skull with their soap-soaked hands, would claw for purchase in the soft folds of my brain with their neatly manicured nails, grab my ears, shake me, try to ascertain the nature of my carefully trapped treasures by the rattle they made. But my mind stayed locked, my lips infuriatingly sealed shut. I guarded my mind so jealously that even I almost forgot how to open it. And all the while, I was accruing a bounty. Pomegranate seeds and scarlet cloaks, sailing ships and oil silk wings and questing beasts, my deepest obsessions and nestled beside them, the things that frightened me. Bluebeard in all of his cobalt ferocity, half feral wolves, china dolls and Christmas ghosts. All locked away in the menagerie of my mind, all tame as long as I could keep my brain closed tight, could deprive them of oxygen. I became, if possible, an even more guarded creature than before. I defended my knowledge snappishly as a feral beast shelters a wounded limb. My language was not like that of other children, but a deliberate cryptography. I was determined not to be understood. At eight years old, gnawing reluctantly at a cooking apple with my sprayed milk teeth, I stood fast against my mother's stories. But why would she open the box? I cried. Why would she do something so silly? The response was a sigh because it wouldn't be a very interesting story otherwise. This was a non-answer and meant nothing to me. It was a blank sheet, more impossible even than the riddles of true speech. I folded it up and locked it away all the same. As I grew, the things I kept grew of a stranger, ever more complicated. Pied pipers and saccharine witches gave way to wild women and dangerous men. The toy science of childhood grew molten and acidic. It became more and more difficult to force things into a containable shape, to keep them trapped away. Sometimes I could feel my head ache from the press of them, claustrophobic and mangled and pushing ever outwards. But still, I refused. I simply would not consider even the slightest peek at it all, could not risk setting such fear fierce and unknowable thoughts loose upon the innocent world. They might have stayed there forever, might have died inside me. I could have managed that, I think, although the effort would have been a lifelong agony. But I was saved from such a fate. Someone saved me. I was 18, only nominally an adult, dizzy with change and the wine that puckered my lips, lost in a black gown sea of gabbled speech. The women around me seemed such outward creatures, shaping their knowledge with broad conductor's hand strokes as it drifted over the table. I was overwhelmed by awe, I watched the candle wax overflow and pool on the tablecloth. A handful of their words, so carelessly allowed to wander, reached my ears. Everybody would open the box. There's nobody in the world who could resist that kind of curiosity. Something reared in me as I recognised the hated tale of my childhood. I wanted to rebel, to say I could, but my lips were locked up tight, even welded shut. So I did not speak. I ate in silence and felt the leaden weight of it all more heavily than ever. I put the woman's words away without looking at them, my old custom. 
As we left the hall, the pressure of my mind grew to a crescendo. I weaved through the mud muddle of hot, perfume bodies, the complex dances of word and thought, the jocular laughter. I allowed my weight to tumble against an unlocked door, revelling as I fell into open space. It was a shadowy, oddly still room. The sheer plushness of the carpet seemed to muffle everything, and even the wallpaper was quiet. The fireplace was unlit, the grandiose leather chairs clustered around its hollow corners. I did not see the girl until she spoke. You're different, she said. It was not a judgmental statement, but a truth, landing solidly at my feet. She was draped across the chair, her legs thrown across the armrest. Her gown and the ancient tuxedo she had worn beneath it were artfully rumpled. Her hair was as red as the bricks. One pale hand propped up a pipe, and its tendrils of smoke danced between us like words escaping her grasp. I didn't respond to her statement. I didn't feel a need to. You disagreed with the things I said at dinner, but you didn't say so. I realised, then, that she was the girl who had spoken of Pandora. I've never liked that story, I said, then annoyed with my own lack of specificity. I've never understood it. Her mouth twitched with secret amusement at my words, but her voice remained kind. It's the oldest story there is, she said. The curious, disobedient woman. What's not to understand? Why? I asked. The syllable landed with great gravity, far more than I had meant. Why would, would you do something so dangerous? Her smile morphed then into something wicked, something rebellious. The shadows leaned forward in anticipation. I felt the caged creatures of my mind begin to seethe and tremble. Why not? she asked. And our eyes met like a lock clicking open.